Welcome to the Living Faith series presented by your sisters in Christ, the Antiochian Women of the East. Our guest in this video is the Right Reverend Father Jeremy Davis, who is sharing his insights from his book, Welcoming Gifts, Sacrifice in the Bible and Christian Life. Many thanks to Father Jeremy for sharing his time and knowledge for the Living Faith series. Praise be to God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. O Christ, our God, we are all pledged to serve thee with our whole being. Help us to continue to work for thee through our church without seeking praise, without seeking personal gain, without judging others, without a feeling that we have worked hard enough and now must allow ourselves rest. Give us strength to do what is right and help us to go on striving and to remember that activities are not the main thing in life. The most important thing is to have our hearts directed and attuned to thee. Amen. 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 Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Living Faith series. We are having tonight Father Jeremy Davis, the author of the book, Welcoming, Welcoming Gifts, Sacrifice in the Bible and the Christian Life. And it's very interesting. We're looking forward to hear Father uh, Jeremy. He's going to talk about sacrifice. And we, like we change the idea what you mean by sacrifice we we meant it something we have been thinking of sacrifice uh, a meaning but there is other meaning behind it now tonight father jeremy is going to discover for us what they mean by sacrifice and um thank you all for joining as i said uh, father jeremy he's going to talk for 30 minutes, 30 to 35 minutes. And after that, we're gonna open the floor for a question. And uh, first, Father Jeremy, thank you. And the AWE blessed to have you and thank you for accepting our invitation. And uh, can you please at the beginning, introduce yourself a little bit about um, your bio and uh, please all ladies mute yourself. If you have any question, just keep it for at the end. You can put your question in the chat below. And one of the ladies at the end, we're going to read the question for Father Jeremy. Thank you all. Thank you, Father Jeremy. And the floor for you. And please, ladies, can you put a uh, speaker review? Very good. Thank you. Uh, so just a little bit about myself to begin with. I am Father Jeremy Davis, and I'm an Archmandrite. Um, currently serving at the Archdiocese headquarters. That's my day job, but right now I also have a temporary gig, which is pastor of St. Anthony Bergenfield. And it's nice to see some of the ladies here from, from St. Anthony's. I'll be doing that for uh, about four and a half months, uh, filling in until a permanent pastor can be assigned. At the Archdiocese, my role is to assist the Metropolitan with pastoral matters throughout the Archdiocese having to do with priests and parishes. Uh, and, and so it, that involves a lot of things, um, including uh, coordinating, overseeing ordinations uh, and uh, seminary applications and assignment of priests and all that kind of thing. But I've been in this administrative role for just a little like a year and a half, I think. Um, before that, I was pastor uh, of Holy Ascension Orthodox Church in Norman, Oklahoma for five years. And before that, I was associate pastor at St. Elijah in Oklahoma City for 10 years. So um, I had 15 years of pastoral experience in parishes before coming to the Archdiocese. So this book, Welcoming Gifts, Sacrifice in the Bible and Christian Life, um, it is really uh, a project that developed over several years and came from questions I myself had after converting to orthodoxy. And um, when I had been Protestant, before I became orthodox, there were certain ideas that I had been taught about 
uh, sacrifice and specifically about the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and how he saved us. Uh, when I became Orthodox, those ideas didn't seem to fit into the Orthodox mindset, but I didn't know what to replace them with. And this is something we, you know, we all believe, you know, in Christ's sacrifice and we trust in Christ's sacrifice that saves us, but maybe we don't often think deeply about how that sacrifice saves us and what it means for us. So when after that, after I converted, I, you know, was kind of mulling over these ideas and eventually decided to do some research. So um, I read from historians and anthropologists and sociologists about um, what ancient sacrifice meant. So talking about really what sacrifice meant in biblical times. Um, and then studying the church fathers, uh, which is, is most important, looking at those ancient Christian teachers that were much closer to the time of our Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles and um, can give us a much more sort of authentic understanding of what the faith means. Um, maybe some ideas that have become um, obscure or, or even distorted uh, through the passage of years, the church fathers can help us to, to clarify those and get closer to the source. Um, so this book is the result of, of that research and not knowing how many of you have, have read it. Um, I think for the rest of my time speaking, I'm going to just give kind of an overview of what what the what the book says, uh, and then we'll we'll see what specific questions you have. So today, when we think about sacrifice, um, first of all, I hopefully we all recognize as Christians that it is a really important topic. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, the death of Christ on the cross, which saves us we call it a sacrifice. And so we're saved by the sacrifice of Christ. Uh, and then also, you know, we're called in the scriptures in our Christian life to make sacrifices ourselves, to offer sacrifices to God. And there's all kinds of things that we do that in the Bible are called sacrifices. So the Bible says that prayer is a sacrifice. It says, um, that uh, obedience to God is a sacrifice, says giving to help the poor and the needy. That's another kind of sacrifice. Um, and then in, in very early Christian literature outside of the Bible, fasting is called a sacrifice. And we would often you know, use that kind of language when talking about fasting. Um, but sacrifice is also uh, a very difficult subject for us. It's kind of a scary subject. Like when I say sacrifice, you know, a lot of people will cringe. They'll be like, oh, what's he asking us to do? Because when we think of sacrifice, we think of loss and we think of violence, you know, I mean, think about the rituals of sacrifice. When I say sacrificial ritual, you may think of, you know, like, um, violently cutting an animal's throat or, or even, you know, in the movies, I don't know if any of you are, remember the movie Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, mm -hmm. the second Indiana Jones movie, which is about this, you know, evil priest who reaches into people's chests and pulls out their hearts and, you know, uh, commits these really scary, frightening uh, sacrificial rituals uh, um, in, in service of his God. Um, this is kind of how we how we think about sacrifice. And so it's a little puzzling. On one hand, as Christians, sacrifice is something we need to do. And on the other hand, our impression of sacrifice is something that we really don't want to do, you know, um, even sacrifices in our lives when we think about giving up and losing things and, and giving up things for for some higher good. Well, if, if it were possible, we'd rather not give up those things, you know, if, if we could, could get away with it. However, you might be surprised that in the Bible, 
sacrifice doesn't have all of those kind of negative feelings that we associate with it. You know, sacrifice throughout the Bible is a joyful thing. It's like a celebration. Um, people don't approach it with the same kind of reticence or, you know, like um, uh, qualms or mixed feelings like we do. They approached it with joy and, and they regularly sacrificed to God. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because it meant something very different to them. So in the ancient world, sacrifices were offerings of food mm -hmm. to God. Um, so when an animal was sacrificed, really it was its meat that was being offered to God. You know, the animal was killed, but its killing was merely like butchering an animal like we'd have to do today in order to, um, you know, have meat to eat. Uh, so when an animal was sacrificed, it was butchered in order to offer meat to God. But animal sacrifice wasn't the only kind of sacrifice. In fact, there were many other sacrifices of grain or olive oil or wine. Um, all of these are called sacrifice or baked goods, actually. I mean, we don't often think of this, but um, people would bake cakes or, or uh, crackers. There were different ways that you could prepare um, these food offerings to God. And then they would bring them this meat, this um, olive oil, wine, grains, baked goods would be brought to God's house, which was his temple, and then ceremonially burned on an altar, which was called his table, so that symbolically this, this food would go up to him. And it was a gesture. I mean, think about when you offer food to people. What does that mean? It means that you're welcoming them, right? You're showing them that they are, that you want them to be a part of your life. When you invite guests to your house and you, you know, prepare a, a beautiful table to host them, um, this is a symbolic gesture of welcome and invitation. Um, that you want to be friends with them. And really, this is the symbolism that was at the heart of ancient sacrifice. It was a way of demonstrating to God that you wanted him in your life. Now, there's much more specific meaning. There were certain kinds of sacrifice, which were specific to certain kinds of occasions. Um, sin offerings. So when people would commit a sin, uh, they were taught in the Old Testament that they needed to bring a sacrifice to God. Well, what is that? It's a way of showing God, you know, like, look, I'm sorry for my sin, mm -hmm. but I really do want you in my life. Even though I did this thing that seems to show that I don't want you in my life, I've realized it was a mistake and I do want you in my life. And so this meal was a way to sort of like to make amends with God, um, to show him that, that you do want friendship with him. Then there were sacrifices of thanksgiving. So when, um, when you realized that God had blessed you, you could offer him these food offerings as a way to thank him, to show your gratitude, and to really say, you know, look, thank you for this gift. I want an even closer relationship with you. Uh, and then there were whole burnt offerings, which in, in which like a, um, a lavish gift was given to God to show him that, that you wanted him to be everything for you and that you wanted to give your whole life to him. So these are all the kind of symbolism that were wrapped up in symbolisms that were wrapped up in this uh, ritual of Old Testament sacrifice. And there was... In, uh, another layer of, of symbolism in the fact that all of these food offerings had to fit certain criteria. Um, it wasn't just any food that you could offer God, but it had to be certain kinds of food. 
And these kinds of food fit, uh, had to fit three sort of, had to have three qualities, three qualities. One is that they had to be um, domesticated agriculture. What I mean by that is it wasn't like you went out and hunted a deer or something like that. These were animals that you raised on your property that, that you know, were tame animals that were obedient to you. And so they, symbol obe they symbolize obedience like um, sheep and cattle uh, and goats. Um, these were obedient to human beings and so they symbolize the quality of obedience. They're also herbivores, not carnivores. So they don't eat other animals. And in this way, they, they symbolize, you know, not harming others. Uh, and then finally, these were animals that provided a lot of benefits to human beings. So not just food, but think about, you know, sheep, they provide wool or cattle, they provide milk um, and their hides, you know, provide clothing. Um, so they also, these animals also symbolized um, being fruitful and helping other people, being beneficial and helpful to other people. So in these ways, these gifts represented the kind of qualities that God wants to see in our lives. He wants us to be obedient towards him. He wants us to not harm our fellow man. And he wants us to provide for the needs of others. And so when someone offered these gifts, they, they really represented a, the offering to God of um, the kind of life that he wants from us. They symbolize that. Now, a way to sort of see it even more simply, like just on our everyday level, when, when a man wants to, you know, start courting a woman, he maybe brings her chocolates. Why does he bring her chocolates? Or he maybe brings her flowers. Why does he bring her flowers? Chocolates are sweet, right? Flowers are pleasant. And they symbolize a pleasant and sweet life. Like he's trying to demonstrate to her, look, I want to be sweet on you. <laughs> I want to have a, you know, I want to be pleasant towards you. Um, the, the gifts that he's offering represent the kind of qualities that he's pledging or promising to show to her. And likewise, in these gifts that ancient Israelites were offering to God, they were pledging to live in a certain way that was pleasing to God. Um, so you can see, like, the whole idea of sacrifice is very different from what we think. You know, it's not, it's not about death and killing and loss and suffering and all of those kind of things. It's about welcoming God into our lives by making gestures that are, you know, pledges of, um, of faithfulness towards God. Uh, let's see how much time we have. It's a long book. Yeah. So I'll, 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 I'll try, just summarize a little bit more, you know, how this applies to us. Mm -hmm. On one hand, um, our Lord Jesus Christ, he saved us by offering a sacrifice. Now, when we think about the cross, we focus on the, the fact that he died, um, that he died. And some people have this idea that, God somehow demanded that someone had to die because of human sin. You know, like there's a death penalty for human sin and God was going to kill us. But instead, Jesus came and he let God kill him instead so that God doesn't have to kill us. It's a really strange idea. You probably heard it, you know, from other Christian groups. It's not really an orthodox idea. Um, and, and it it's revolves around these same ideas of sacrifice as, as being killing and violence and suffering and death. 
But now think about what Christ did in the context of what I'm talking about. What did Christ do for us? He offered to God on behalf of humanity the perfect demonstration of faithfulness, right? Our Lord Jesus Christ was sinless, but that doesn't mean just that he didn't do anything bad. It means that he lived the perfectly good life towards God that God wants us to live. He was perfectly obedient to God. He was uh, perfect in his love towards his fellow man, like not, you know, harming others and providing, you know, for the benefit of others. I mean, look at all the people that he healed. Look at, you know, the the 5,000 or the thousands of people, even more than 5,000, the thousands of people that he fed who were in need of food. You know, he was constantly, you know, doing good towards his fellow man and being obedient to his father. And um, the cross, what the cross represents is the perfect, ultimately, the ultimately perfect proof of that good life. Because at the end of his life, he was confronted by, you know, the prospect that, look, if you persist in what you're doing, we're going to hang you on this cross. That's what the Jews, you know, that's, that was their attitude towards Christ. If you persist in what you're doing, preaching these words and, and, you know, like embarrassing us by helping the people in ways that we can't help them. If you persist in doing this, we're going to hang you on that cross. And Christ could have avoided it, if he just said, oh, yeah, my bad, never mind. And if he sort of like compromised his faithfulness towards the father on one hand, or on the other hand, as he himself says to Pilate, he says, I could summon 12 legions of angels and destroy all of you. And that's not just a, an empty threat, because in the Old Testament, we hear that God sent one angel from heaven and destroyed an army of Assyrians that was, I think, 150,000. So God's able to do that. And Christ could have done that and avoided the cross, but he didn't because he loved even those people who were, you know, persecuting him. And so he was willing to endure the cross um, and uh, in order to uh, persist and, 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 and continue in that life of faithfulness and not to compromise it in any way, even to the point of death. He was faithful to us and to God, even to the point of death. That's really what the cross is about. And therefore, the cross represents not just like a symbol. Remember, those animals were just symbols of obedience. They weren't, you know actual human obedience. They were just sort of images of what human obedience might look like. But Christ offers to God the perfect demonstration of, of obedience and faithfulness uh, in his life. And he offers that to God on our behalf as an invitation to God to come into human lives uh, and, and, and be with us. And by his death also, he actually forged a new way of obedience and faithfulness that we can follow him on. And he taught us that way. And he empowers us by giving us his Holy Spirit so that we can, like him, be uh, faithful to God and faithful in our love towards others, even when it hurts. Um, and so we can welcome God into our lives. And so we have all these other ways of sacrifice now, which are ways of inviting God into our life, you know, praying, spending time with him in prayer, fasting, which is not just about suffering. Fasting is about prioritizing God and our time with God and not letting food be sort of this crutch, emotional and spiritual crutch that we use to avoid 
you know, a, a, a avoid turning to God in our pain. Um, obedience, like, you know, obeying God, even when it hurts, that's a way of, of showing God that we want him in our lives. But even though there is difficulty and suffering and loss involved in it, it's not, that's not the point. The point is showing God that we want him in our lives by how we live. Um, so that's a lot. And boy, that's summarizing 300 pages in half an hour. <laughs> so <laughs> just scratching the surface. But um, I think that's probably all that I want to say. Now I want to hear your questions. And like those who read the book, those who haven't read the book, like what do you want to talk about? What do you want to know? Lulu, we do have a question that came in the chat. Okay. If you want me to read it. Yes, please, because I'm unable to see the chat. Okay. Um, in Psalm 50, the hymn of repentance that we say every Sunday in the precess before the great entrance. The psalm ends with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Can you please explain this in light of what you said? What is this? What is this means in today's time? Fasting from food, anger, being more obedient, being more Christ-like. I just wonder what these words mean. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's great. I mean, really, we see summed up there. I'm going to pull up that verse. I have the Bible on my computer and um, pull up Psalm 50. And so the, the last few verses say, for thou hast no delight in sacrifice. Were I to give a burnt offering, thou wouldst not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good to Zion in thy good pleasure. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then wilt thou delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on thine altar. So remember Psalm 50 is the psalm that David wrote after he had sinned and after he was confronted with really a huge a double sin. Um, he committed adultery. And then in order to hide the adultery, when the woman got pregnant, he commanded her husband to go um, into battle and basically into a suicide mission. And her husband was killed. So it was murder and adultery both. Just a really heinous and terrible sin. But he writes this psalm, you know, out of a broken heart, pleading with God for forgiveness. Um, when he says, thou hast no delight in sacrifice, he's not saying, uh, and actually, I think in our, um, let me see what it says in the Greek. I'm reading from the RSV, which is an English translation. Thou didst not desire sacrifice, I think, is, is what it it says in the, the Greek that God didn't desire sacrifice. And honestly, one of the little details about the Old Testament sacrificial system was that only very minor sins could be resolved through sacrifice. Actually, the Old Testament law says that if you committed a really terrible sin, like the sins that David committed, that sacrifice wasn't good enough. Because think about it, it's like giving candy or giving, giving God flowers, you know, and that may be okay, like so, sort of if you, if, if, if a husband, you know, annoys his wife, he brings her candy and flowers, and maybe that's good enough. But if he commits adultery, and he brings her candy or flowers, she's going to, that's probably not going to cut it. That's not going to do it, right? Because just a gift, just that gesture is too too little to to reconcile after um, after after such a serious offense. So David recognizes that that's not enough. That just these food offerings is not enough. That he's not going to be pleased with simply offer making an offering like that. However, God will be pleased 
David says, by a broken and contrite heart. Because that's what God really wants. I mean, to see that we really recognize what we did was wrong and that we are willing to change our ways. So that sincere repentance from the heart, that's what's going to show God that we really want him in our lives, not just giving him some kind of symbolic gift, but having that deep sense of, of, um, of repentance. And then David says, um, once we're reconciled to God through repentance, we pray that he would rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, meaning to rebuild our lives, to rebuild us as a holy habitation where God, you know, can dwell, because Jerusalem was the, the place where God said he would dwell. And then if God does restore our lives, if he, re, rest, you know, restores us as a habitation for him, then we can offer him other sacrifices in our lives that will be pleasing to him, other continuous gestures of, of welcome by, uh, you know, spending time with him in prayer, by serving the poor and needy as, as an act of love towards God. Um, so, yeah, so it's really, Psalm 50 is a really beautiful encapsulation of, of all of this teaching about sacrifice. People, when they hear that thou desires not sacrifice, sometimes they say, oh, well, God didn't like sacrifice in the Old Testament. God didn't want sacrifice in the Old Testament. That's not really what it's saying. God himself is the one who commanded sacrifice in the beginning. But what David's saying is in this case, because what I did was so terrible, the food gifts, those rituals are not going to cut it. What, what's needed is, some, is, is an even deeper kind of sacrifice, a deeper kind of offering, which is that broken hearted repentance okay um i have another question from rita she said i have not read the book so wondering what are the other gifts okay uh, other gifts meaning like the ones that we offer in our own lives maybe um I talked mainly about the the gifts that are that were offered in the Old Testament, those symbolic gifts. But even more important to us are the gifts that we offer in our own lives. So obeying God, um, on one hand, refusing to do evil. And I have a quote here. Like I said, my my research, a lot of my research was with the the um, the church fathers and saint john chrysostom mm -hmm. says how might the body as saint paul says become a sacrifice he says let the eye look at no evil thing and it has become a sacrifice let the tongue say nothing disgraceful and it has become an offering let the hand do no lawless deed and it has become a whole burnt offering or rather, these are not enough. But we also need to work at good things so that the hand might do charitable work. The mouth might bless those who are abusive and the hearing might be devoted to the divine scriptures. So what he's saying is these are the kind of offerings that God wants us to, to give him. These are ways of showing God we want him in our life. I mean, think about it. Um, if, 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 if you have a friend and you are constantly just disregarding that friend's um, preferences, you know, that, that friend wants to go to the movies and you say, no, 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 let's go to the mall. Or that friend says, you know, they want to go on vacation to the Bahamas and you say, no, 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 let's go to Europe. And you're constantly sort of dismissing their wishes it's really showing them, you, even if you don't intend it, it's showing them you don't want them in your life. But if you listen to what they say and maybe even do what they want to do, even if it's not what you want to do, that shows them that you want, uh, shows them that you want them in your life. So the same is true with God. Like by obeying him, we show him that we want to be in relationship with him. 
that we want to be friends with him. By turning our back on the things that he doesn't like, and by focusing on the things that he does like, that's how we show him that we want to be his friends. Okay, thank you, Father. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Yes, there is another one that came in, Rula. Um, yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Don't read it, please. Okay. Um, in the book, it was explained that the sacrifices offered by the ancient Jews did not please the Lord because they were insincere, even though they followed the law. Although Jesus's sacrifice was perfect, how do we make sure that we are approaching our daily sacrifices? properly and sincerely not just going through the motions of fast and such taught by the church how do we keep ourselves on track with what god wants of us right right so yeah so that's spot on um the jews sort of kept the the letter the surface but they neglected the spirit of the law um and so they, they were just sort of like trying to cheat, trying to cheat, trying to um, trying to like do the easy things um, without doing the hard work um, inside themselves. So our temptation is going to be to kind of be legalistic like them and focus on um, the the outward things um, that are, in a sense, easier. So, you know, like fasting, for example. Fasting, there, there are fasting rules. And you could just follow the rules um, as a sort of legalistic exercise um, and think, well, that's good enough. I pleased God. But the point of fasting is not the rules. The point of fasting is to, to put our trust in God, to depend on God instead of depending on the pleasure that we get from food. So for example, when, you know, sometimes when we have a hard day, what do we do? Like my temptation is come home and pull out a tub of ice cream, <laughs> start, start eating the ice cream, right? And, and, but that's depending on food, to heal my soul, which when you think about it, well, who's supposed to heal my soul? It's God that's supposed to heal my soul, right? Not food. And in fact, I'm like making ice cream and I'm depending on ice cream instead of depending on God. So I'm kind of making ice cream my God. And that's kind of offensive, right? So now just not eating the ice cream, if it's a fast day, that's, that's not enough. The point is not to eat the ice cream and instead to go and pray, right? To pray and ask God, like, I've had a really hard day, like, help me. Or to turn to the scriptures and find that encouragement in the scriptures, you know, the words of God. So um, I think just to kind of to sum it up, that's one example, the fasting example. But, um, you know, another example is like, giving to the poor like we could actually give to the poor in a very legalistic way like god wants me to give you know so i'm gonna just write a hundred dollar check and send it to uh iocc or something like that and 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 that'll be pleasing to god but no what god wants us to do is he wants us to love our neighbors because they're people that he loves and and he wants us to care for them i mean another quote from saint john chrysostom he has this beautiful homily. I won't, I'll just paraphrase it, not read it because it's a long quote. But he has this beautiful homily where he describes the poor as an altar on which we offer sacrifice to God. So by giving to the needy, to the poor and needy, we are making an offering to God. And he says, it's not just enough to give to them. He says, you should reverence them, just like you reverence the holy altar, right? We hold the holy altar in this like sacred reverence. And he says, the poor are an altar and you should reverence them. You know, 
And think about that. Like if we, when we give to the poor and the needy, it's, the, you know, the material help that we give them is maybe less important than the fact that we show them honor and respect, that we treat them with that kind of respectful love that, that recognizes their humanity and affirms their humanity. So just to kind of sum it all up, like it's, I think it's, it's really focusing on the relational connection um, with those things and doing those things that we're called to do, not just because we have to, but, but, but because we want to show God how important he is to us. And we want to connect to God and we want to love the things that God loves. We want to love the people that God loves um, because we want to be in fellowship with God. Okay, thank you, Father. Nancy, I'm not able to see comments. Are you able to see any comments? Yes, I do. There was another one that came in from Susan. It says, our five senses communicate past our logical mind. How do the sacrifices help us letting go of the rules? Hmm, that's interesting. Well, I think maybe the best way to um, to discuss that is to bring in a, like another like important sacrifice. It's not just any important. It's like the key sacrifice that we still practice as Orthodox Christians, which is the Eucharist. You know, the the Eucharist is called the bloodless sacrifice. Um, and when you think about it, what is offered in the Eucharist? It's, it's an offering of food, bread and wine that are offered to God first and foremost. And by the way, it's not just bread and wine, but it's bread and wine that have been symbolically prepared in order to represent the body and blood of, of Christ. Um, and then we offer them to God as a pledge that we're going to uh, live like Christ, that we want to live like Christ in that obedient, faithful lifestyle. Uh, and then the priest prays that God, by his Holy Spirit, would make those food gifts into the actual body and blood of Christ to be returned to us in order to transform us. So really, that's an experience that goes beyond just rule keeping, right? It's about... Um, making an offering of our aspirations, our good intentions toward God, and then receiving from him the grace to actually live in accord with those good intentions, to be transformed into an image of Christ, each of us to be transformed into an image of Christ, um, which is, is what, we, what we want. What, what we've sought from him. So um, in that sense, yeah, it goes beyond just like a humanistic effort. We need Christ in us. And in the Eucharist, we taste Christ coming into us uh, in order to, to transform us and strengthen us uh, to, be, to be friends of God. Okay, Father, thank you. There's another ruler. Yeah, I, I don't know why I'm able to see it. <laughs> I don't know why you can't either. Uh, but mm -hmm. Actually, because it's a direct message to me. Um, uh -huh. Father Jeremy mentions how important it is to turn to God, even during difficult times, when we are suffering. Does he have a favorite quote in mind or a section of the book or scripture that can help us during times of suffering and struggling? Okay. Can you read that again? Sure. How important it is to turn to God, even during difficult times when we are suffering. Do you have a favorite quote in mind or a section of the book or scripture that can help us during times of suffering and struggling? Mm, there are a lot. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, 
I, and I have to I have to look up the um, the uh, the references um, in the book of Hebrews. It talks about how um, Christ is our great high priest who has suffered, you know, everything that we have suffered. He's been tried uh, in every way uh, as as we have been tried. I'm looking at that up so I can read it for you. I used, I used to be evangelical Protestant so I could quote scripture, but I've been too, away from it for too long. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. So this is Hebrews chapter four, verses 14 through 16. Yeah, this is, this is beautiful. This is spot on. Um, hold on. Let me, okay. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So that really, I think, one of the best. Is it Father Hebrew uh, chapter 4 to 14? Chapter 4, verses uh -huh. 14 through 16. Okay, 14 to 16. Thank you, Father. Yeah. Because really the whole book of Hebrews was written to Christians who were suffering for their faith. And it was written as a way to encourage them to, to continue and remain true to Christ because um, uh, help, our help comes from him. So really, this, just, these verses just kind of summarize the whole message of Hebrews. Thank you, Father. Nancy, any comments? Anyone would like to unmute himself, yourself and ask the question? Welcome, you can do that. That was the last of the questions I had, Rula. Okay. Any other question? Okay. I have a question. Um, back home in my country, we do sacrifice sheep, lambs, cows, and, and there is, we have a historic church. It's back, uh, Jesus visited that church. It's mentioned in the Bible. And uh, what do you think about that? Is that uh, a Jewish habit or that's, a, this is not, is, is it still a Christian habit? What, what do you think about that? When you, when you say sacrifice, what, what do you, what do you do? Okay, uh, for example, or what do they do? For example, like if um, a, like a parent, their son uh, has accident, but accident was very, 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 uh, very uh, dangerous accident, but he survived from that. I said, oh, thank God, if he, my son came back alive, we will sacrifice a sheep, a lamb, and give uh, it to the poor. Yep, and so what do they do? They take the sheep or the lamb to the church and do what? Go to that the historic church. They like they uh, butcher it. Mm -hmm. butcher? Yeah, butcher the lamb and give the meat to the poor, not yeah. to, that, to the poor people, not to the, themselves. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, that's that's really taking uh, the Old Testament practice and then bringing it into. Um, into a Christian context, there's nothing uh, wrong with it. So it's the, basically what's happening, even though you know we would focus on the killing of the animal, mm -hmm. that's not really the focus for Christians. The focus for Christians is the fact that the meat is given to the poor, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So um, and Hebrews also, uh, the, the book of Hebrews, um, at the end it says, do not neglect to do good and to share with others, to share what you have, for God is well pleased with such sacrifices. 
So um, what, what you're describing is really a, a gesture of thanksgiving to God by sharing what we have with those who are in need, those with the poor. Um, so it's, it's a beautiful, uh, it's, it's a beautiful, you know, way of, of, of doing sacrifice, like in a, in a Christian way, as long as we focus on the right thing, it's not just, it's not about killing the animal. It's about, no, no. about giving the, the meat away to the. Yeah. The thank poor. God for his life, for the son, the wife, mm -hmm. uh, anyone life. Thank you, God. Like we sacrifice the, the cow, the meat, the sheep. And instead mm -hmm. of my son, or instead of my daughter. Or yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, we have to be careful how we describe it. It's, it's really, it's about, you know, it's, it's not about a, a, a life in place of a life or something like that. It's, it's about, it's about showing God we love him by, you know, caring for others, by distributing thank food you. to the thank others. You. Yeah. We mean like a thank, thank God. Yep. Thank God for, for, is that still Christian? Uh, yeah. Um, as long as it's understood in the right way, I think so. And another, like another example, um, I um, heard from a friend of mine who's Bulgarian. He said that, like, if they have something happen like that where they feel blessed and you know God spared their child or or something good happen, that they'll uh, cook a fish maybe and take the fish to the church, and the priest will say some prayers, um, and they're kind of making an offering of that fish to, to you know at, in the church to God, and then it's divided up and um the priest gets some of it and the, the people take some of it to eat and it's it's and they have a meal and and celebrate the good thing that god did um, which is very similar to the old testament sacrifice of the peace offering um where uh you know a sacrifice was made to god and then part of the meat was burned on the altar part of the food it's not just meat but part of the food uh was burned on the altar and then the rest was returned to the people and they had like a, a feast of, of celebration um, to honor God for, for what he'd done for them. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Father. Okay, we have seven minutes left. Any other question for Father Jeremy Davis, the author of the book? Father, do you have another book, yes? The salary one? Yes, yes. So. Um... A children's book, children's the Seller's book. Celery, mm -hmm. which is uh, about uh, monks in a monastery and how they um, how they help each other. So it's written in it's written in rhyme. Um, kind of a fun book. The illustrations are beautiful. I didn't do the illustrations. A man named Luke Garrow did. By mm -hmm. the way, both of these books are at ancientfaith.com. It's mm -hmm. published by Ancient Faith. So. They can be purchased there. Anyone interested? For which age that children book like? I'm not very good at that. I mean, I think really for for little kids, it's good to read to them. You know, like little kids like books that have rhyming in them. The, they like the sound of the rhyme. Um, uh, and then I think probably up through maybe eight years old for reading it themselves. Okay. But I'm not very good at that. Yeah, ladies, were you interested to buy it for your grandchildren, for your children? You can find it on the Ancient Faith Radio. Okay, any other question, ladies? Nope, no question. Okay, uh, I want to thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Father Jeremy Davis, the author of the Welcoming Gifts Sacrifice in the Bible and the Christian Life. And I want to remind you all for the upcoming events the AWE having um, in March 17th to the 19th, we have our annual Lenten retreat at the village, at the Antiochian uh, village. And uh, the, uh, the speaker, she's going to be Sarah Brian Martelli. She's the author of this book, uh, Memory Eternal. And she, the topic is going to be Joy Comes in the Morning. And it's going to be a full weekend, a pilgrimage to Santa Thecla. 
Um, it's going to be fun to get together again to see each other. The same weekend will be the DMC spring retreat. Will be if your husband and the wife coming, the husband can go with a DMC retreat. Father Damick is going to be the speaker, and the ladies can join the Ethiopian woman for um, for Tara's uh, uh, topic. And the second thing, um, March is going to be the Ethiopian Woman Month. And I ask all of you to be more active in your church and do more activities. And uh, we're looking for a report from all of you by the end of May. And we're going to send a reminder for that. And uh, I think that's it, what I have. And uh, we, can, and we can finish our uh, meeting with a prayer from Father Don or Father Jeremy. And the blessing to all the ladies. And uh, go ahead. Thank you, Rua. Thank you, Father Jeremy, also. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, Father Jeremy, would you be so kind as to offer the closing prayer, please? Sure. Thank it you. is truly me to bless the Theotokos, her to ever blessed, all blameless, and the mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, more glorious being compared than the seraphim. Thou without corruption didst bear God the word, and our truly Theotokos, we magnify thee. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. God is with us through his divine grace and love toward mankind, always, now, and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Thank you, Father. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you all. Thank you for joining the Antiochian Women of the East for this installment of the Living Faith series. Please remember to join us on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page.